you know, because of low fees, it's going to be very difficult for us to effectively address all the other things that we need to be worrying about. Episode 78. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15-minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business-wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far, and with your permission, of course, what might be next, what might be possible, and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and today I've got a special episode coming to you where I'm going to be reviewing a question that I posed on Twitter this week that actually got quite a lot of engagement from everybody. It was like a micro poll, basically, of all the people that follow me on social media. Um, And I asked the question, what is the biggest challenge architects face? Um, And obviously, doing what I do, podcasting, talking to lots of different architects all over the place, a lot of the time, it's really interesting to hear Um, the different kinds of struggles, the different kinds of obstacles that we're facing. Um, And just due to, you know, the limitations of Twitter, I could only really ask a few of them. So I created a little little poll, a little vote. So this is by no means a huge sample... um, of the industry by by any by it's just you know reflective of perhaps the the, the people that follow me, uh, but it was interesting because it did begin a a dialogue and um, we could kind of see this as a kind of micro result if you like. So I I asked, you know, out of out of these, which concern you the most in terms of uh, challenges that that we face as an industry? Number one was Brexit. Number two was climate change, and number three was low fees, and the fourth one was other please specify. So low fees won with uh, 43.5% of the vote. Climate change came second with 32.6%. Um, other came third, 17.4%, though a lot of people didn't necessarily specify what that other one was. And Brexit came last with 6.5%. And um it was interesting, just going to sort of review some of the comments here and I'll kind of jump in and ad lib a little bit over the top. Um, we've got Andy Matthews here. Andy was, um, was, was basically saying that in the short term, it's the fees that are the biggest problem, followed by midterm Brexit, long term climate change. And ultimately, climate change is the over, is, is the one issue that we need to be dealing with. Adrian Schilladay said the technical capacity to deal with those three is one of the massive obstacles that we're facing. Um, and David Lomax actually pointed towards the fact that, you know, because of low fees, it's going to be very difficult for us to effectively address all the other things that we need to be worrying about. Um, Involved magazine, they got in and said unnatural expectations of overtime and the exploitative office culture uh, harming those at the beginning of of their careers. That's a very sort of big worry and concern. And I think actually something like that is probably related back to low fees um, altogether. So after I had 
written that, I went and I asked people, um, you know, why? Why do we, do you believe that? Do you think that low fees is, you know, are architectural fees that low? Is this a massive problem in the industry? And if it is, why? Why are low, what's the root cause of uh, low fees? And um, we had some really, really interesting responses to this as well. So, um, Magnus Strom, who we interviewed and had on the show recently, said, because clients do not see value in what it is that we do, or perhaps we do not deliver value, if we start selling value rather than ours, the game changes. We only accept commissions where clients understand and share the value we bring. Now, this conversation around value is something that I hear a lot in the industry. It's commented upon um, again and again and again, and you know the, you'll see in some of the, the comments later on as well that this is a, a recurring criticism of architects, uh, either not being able to communicate or articulate value, or our clients not being able to recognise it. Now, from my perspective and speaking to you know marketeers and and sales and the way that we learn to understand what value is this is obviously going it's going to d differ from architect to architect it's going to differ from client to client about what actually is the most important and magnus is a great example because of the way his practice operates um he was telling us you know they use simple solutions like price banding for example a kind of giving a uh, a good, better and best service where they clearly mark out what's included in that. And that kind of starts to give a sort of referential point of difference uh, and helps clients understand the value that they are getting. So you start to create a means of comparison internally with what you're proposing to your market. Um, salespeople, very skilled professional salespeople will know that being able to understand the client's problem and articulate it back to them in their own language is really, really key and important. Again, I had um, I spoke to Tamir Kadir recently, who is a marketing strategist at Francis Cooper, and she was saying, again, this ability to be able to diagnose our clients' problems and be able to use a language that they understand, that they are already using, is massively important in being able to communicate value because often what's valuable to us as architects, we may have our own architectural agendas, we may have our own agendas to do with sustainability, um, with the kind of materials that we want to use, with public space. And whilst these are very important things to the kind of civic stakeholders that will experience and that we are responsible to as architects, as part of the, you know, the deep core part of our profession, the people that may be paying for our services, that may not be the first thing that's of importance to them. And often they have a very strong uh, financial or business case that is operating behind the scenes. So, uh, it's important for us to be able to speak the language of their business case because then we can bring in these other agendas um, and these other things and make those a priority by demonstrating that we acknowledge and respect and are able to fulfill on what their business case is. And then often, you know, being able to meet somebody at that with that understanding. And this is not just... Uh, playing lip service to to it, but it's it's communicating a wit in a way where the other person acknowledges and recognises, and they feel like they have been gotten. They understand that you understand where they are coming from. That changes something, a dynamic, a, a quality of the relationship. Um, I was listening to Chris Voss recently, who is an FBI negotiator, who's written a fantastic book called uh, Never Split the Difference. And he was talking about when you're in these kind of hostage situations and you're dealing with somebody um, who's on the edge, you know, they've got a lot of emotional things going on and you do not have the opportunity to make a mistake, uh, what are you going to do? And he was saying that the, the most powerful method of diffusing a hostage situation was to communicate in a way where you 
get, you understand the perspective of the terrorist or the person who is holding the hostages. This doesn't mean that you condone what they are doing or that you agree with it or that you support it. It just demonstrates to the other person that you understand their perspective and you're able to use their language. So if you want to go and see some really fantastic examples of that, go and Google Chris Voss. Maybe I can get him on the show. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, but he, you know, he talks about how he's able to, in many of these conversations, meet the other person where they are at using their language and be able to get that kind of deep level of rapport and agreement and understanding which opens up a different conversation so this kind of relates back to this idea of our ability to communicate value and recognizing that what we consider valuable and of value is not always what our client expects as value so we need to be able to be able to we need to be in the listening of the other person um and it's it's interesting, actually, because Sam Schneider, who is a marketeer and copywriter, and he actually um, wrote on the Twitter feed, while this is interesting, what I've observed is that every business where the main model is service, the main problem people state are low fees, low margins, and market saturation. For most of these businesses, the problem is easily solved. Craft a killer offer. That's it. Now... This is a, a very interesting perspective, and it was the you know obviously coming from a from a marketeer, a copywriter. You know, I kind of it, it's it's how they think, right? And I, I really loved it. I love the language that he uses here as well. Craft a killer offer. Well, what does that mean? Craft a killer offer. A killer offer. If we you know if we think about it in, in marketing terms, is something that is solving a need or a problem that our clients have. And ideally, it's, a, it's an emotional need, that there's a bit of emotion and drive behind it because the more emotion that's involved in there, the more likely they are to make some sort of decision. Um, and, you know, we, you might have seen those pyramids of the kind of different stages of where a client may be in the buying triangle and... You know, only over 3% of the people that you may speak to are ready to make a purchase right now, right? There are another 6% maybe in an, a sort of, they're thinking about it. They're thinking about a project. So you might need some sort of diagnostic offer where you can kind of help them understand where their um, problems lie or what types of services they need. And the remaining market, the remaining, what is that, 91% of uh, our potential clients are in a research phase where you know it might be a nice thing in the future and that kind of those three stratas of client readiness if you like or their position of readiness to to make a purchasing decision we need to be able to meet them with different offers so you know people who are in that research phase we want to be able to be educators of the marketplace this is what we talk about a lot in in terms of finding a niche um and being able to create a killer offer in terms of being able to provide something of use of educational value that's solving their problem some some genius architects that i've seen do this obviously joe cowen if you haven't listened to that podcast go and check it out she wonderfully understands the pain points of her developer clients. Now, she's gone from a practice of maybe two people in the early days to a rapid expansion of around 40, 50 people on the King's Road. And the way that she's facilitated that growth is by crafting a killer offer. And what she was able to do was she recognised very astutely that a lot of the property developers... Uh, who she wanted to work with were experiencing a capital problem or an investment problem uh, pre-planning. It was often very difficult to get people to make a, a financial investment or commitment before anything was, you know, solid and in place. And obviously, you know, when you buy a site or a piece of land, the planning decision is one where one of the major uplifts in cost and finance happens once that's been put in place. 
So recognizing that her developer clients are struggling at this point. They're, fi they're finding it difficult to get other people to make that commitment. Their cash flow is hurting as a result of this. Um, you know, one of their biggest expenses, obviously, is the architect's fees. So she was able to structure, and this is not uncommon. I've heard lots of architects do it in lots of different ways. But she structured a an offer where she was able to either postpone fees till post planning. So she had a very robust appraisal system up front. So she knew how she was going to be able to do that. She was also very strategic and very financially astute and aware of what it would take to be able to cash flow something like that. Because, you know, you're potentially cash flowing something like a quarter of a million pounds worth of fees or, or however much it is. Um, for maybe a period of a year and you've got to pay staff, you've got overheads to, to carry on. So you've got to have parts of your business already working and making profit in order to be able to cash flow that or have something else where you're able to put at risk to be able to, to do that. Now, if you're taking that kind of risk as Joe was uh, with your um, structuring of when your planning fees actually will happen, you need to be make sure that you are uh, compensated and rewarded for taking on that risk yourself. Um, and this is another thing because when you're, this is, this is providing value right here because client's got a serious pain problem. You're offering a solution, financial solution, a way to get around it, a way to unlock the potential of the site whilst answering their problems of lack of investment. You can be, you can negotiate, you put yourself in a good position to be able to negotiate either a higher percentage when planning does come through, or if you're thinking really long term and you're thinking commercially and you're thinking about, um, you know, where this developer client is and where they might be going and you want to be able to expand your business at the same time as that they're expanding their business, you might start asking for, you know, a, a cut in equity of the final development or a profit share or something like that. So you're starting to really think long term and you're starting to not necessarily like like, like Magnus is saying here, you're not, you're not you're not selling hours, you're selling value now. And you're also starting to get compensated in a way which is very different. Joe, for example, there as well, she she took that a step further and um, created Joe Cowan Capital, which you know she was on the other sort of uh, part of her business, she had a lot of very wealthy um, residential, private residential clients and recognised that some of them may be suitable candidates who would want to be investing into the larger development projects, the build to rent projects that she was getting engaged with with some of her developer clients. So she crafted a, a sort of holdings company or an assets company or a capital company where people were able to, those clients who she already had fantastic relationships with, were able to put money into and she was now able to approach developers with a pot of money and a killer offer. So who do you think those developers are going to go with? They went with Joe. They went with Joe. So this is really fascinating and the world of profit, uh, property is filled with this kind of creative deal making so anybody who tells you that property is not creative is just absolute nonsense it is incredibly creative the way that they structure deals communication finance how they get things to work how they get things over the line and that is something a conversation that architects are well placed to start when we start viewing our projects it, as financial instruments, when we accept that they are financial instruments in the eyes of a lot of people and particularly our, our clients and we can, be, begun, we can begin to be fluent in that language, then we can start to structure deals that we are that work for us, that create um, a no-lose situation. You know, everybody's getting something of value for themselves um, and you will become able to, you know, put your design agendas forward. So this is with private developments. Um, you know, it's interesting to speculate about how this kind of thing could work with public procurement. We've heard um, Russell Curtis recently on the show discussing, you know, I mean, yeah, we've seen this, the kind of Grenfell inquiry and the absolute kind of craziness that these 
design and build contracts uh, have caused and how you know this is a this is part of the industry where you've got procurement officers who are not necessarily interested in the quality of the project or the life cycle of the projects and they've got a job to do which is to squeeze the architect's fees um, being able to create a killer offer is perhaps not the right wording here but how we can start to communicate value over the lifespan of the of a project and how important it is this becomes increasingly um, something that we need to be able to do as as an industry, and then we cannot accept lower fees because it has does you know really awful awful impact um, on the life cycle of a building. Um, one I've I've spoken to n numerous marketing experts uh, who work with a lot of architectural practices who discuss, for example, the importance of being able to have. Uh, post-occupancy evaluation data or qualitative and quantitative data of the life life cycle and the experience and the uplift in value and performance of our buildings throughout the course of their lives. Now this is not always the easiest data to collate, in some cases it may be very difficult, um, but as a, a sort of marketing asset or a piece of marketing collateral, that is, it, it becomes quite essential and it becomes a, a tool where we can really, you know, you've got sort of hard evidence of de demonstrating um, the power of good design and what it can be, what kind of uplift it can bring um, financially to a client um, and to their business case as well as to society. And this idea of being able to communicate value, uh, again recently there's an interview coming out soon with Thomas Rasher who is a property consultant, a property expert, and he was discussing all the different ways that property is valued and again the importance of architects being able to align um, their design agendas with the business cases of the client and recognizing that every single client that we work with has a business agenda and to be able to inquire about what that agenda is understand it um, and demonstrate that we are, we're understanding it rather than going straight in with propositions um, is a skill in itself and requires this kind of fluency of financial language, of financial literacy, acknowledging the fact that there is a business case that needs to be answered. Even even with private residential clients, there is a business case behind the property. There is a business case happening. Um, so to be really engaged with the commercial side of practice and to see it as another extension of design conversation of creativity starts to open up a different way of communicating value uh, and I, I also think um, speaking to Bride and Wood recently Jamie Johnston this really blew my mind uh, as as an architectural practice I there are very encouraging to see kind of future the the future of architectural practice in these little pockets of the industry and I think Bride and Wood are certainly occupying one of these spaces where they, you know, I went there and they've got a whole floor basically filled with their clients from, you know, airport infrastructure to data centers to pharmaceutical companies, very process driven um, organizations, maybe multi-headed corporate clients um, who understood the value that these architects were bringing to their physical assets. So it wasn't just in the sense of them putting together a competition brief and then taking it out to a whole load of architects and seeing who has the best solution. They recognized the fact that Bride and Wood were really interrogating the brief to such an extent that Bride and Wood had kind of encouraged them to come up with problem statements before, um, you know, a, a uh, an architectural brief was developed. So this kind of very proactive process of diagnosis of a client's um, business case, understanding the processes behind um, the business cases and the functions of the of you know the, of whatever these these companies are doing, puts Bride and Wood in a very very powerful position of being able to win projects or work and also 
I thought that what was really fascinating was that it was not always an architectural or a building solution. Um, and again, they're very much borrowing a lot of this, the ideas for manufacturing and, you know, kind of off-site manufacture. And they're bringing that expertise into the built environment and to the construction process and offering something very bespoke and very useful to their clients. And the architect then becomes perceived as a problem solver, not somebody who's going to just merely deliver on a brief that you've already uh, established. Now, I think that when you get into that position with your with your marketing, um, and this is kind of you know part and parcel of these same principles of being an educator of the marketplace, being someone who's skillful in articulating value. And again, it comes down to this idea of diagnosing with absolute clarity the real problems of what our clients are dealing with. And often those problems are languaged and are existing in some kind of business case of the project. And those business cases underneath all of that is an emotional problem. There's something emotional, uh, which is more difficult to establish and perhaps like a multi-headed corporate organization. But on a one-to-one human level, there is always you know, the kind of emotions that are underneath the kind of the real drivers behind any project. And our jobs as architects is to listen and to understand and to establish what that is. Again, um, talking to Darren Bray recently uh, at the RBA, very similar conversation around the art of deep collaboration with your clients, being able to listen very deeply, to be able to hear the kind of things that are written or being said uh, that are beyond, you know, what they're actually asking for. And that, I think, is a real skill. Um, You know, the industry of marketing, that's what really good marketing is actually about. It's about deep market research. It's about understanding your clients really, really well. You know, we use these kind of tools like the niche and your client avatars, but ultimately it is a form of deep listening and deep communication. Um, just going back to some more of these responses, Rob Hyde, uh, who's up at Manchester School of Architecture, who runs, you know, one of the most, one of the most brilliant professional studies um, courses anywhere in the country, you know, he wrote in in response to why do you think our fees are, are too low? He said, I was about to let rip on the structural issues of our profession as a business or on what needs to be done, who's doing well and why, plus why others are failing, of common mistakes and latent opportunity, but it would be just another tweet into the ether. And then he goes on to write, cultural behavioural change is needed in the profession, from student to practitioner and beyond question is what is the best vehicle to propagate this um and i thought that was really interesting as well because it starts to point towards a uh, a, a cultural aversion i think in many ways in the profession where our education perhaps is not is as embracing of entrepreneurship, of business, as it is all the other constraints that we deal with as architects. In education, we become incredibly skilled at dealing with the site, the the constraints of a site, with the history of the site, with the demands of a fictitious client in many cases, with the political, tectonic, the physical, the environmental constraints that we can conceive of as a student and we're able to weave and dance and you know come up with fantastic ideas and we quickly realize that actually it's a lot easier to design a building in a tight urban spot when we're allowed to do whatever we like than it is to design something on a wide open landscape in some cases right and um but one of the constraints that we don't often come across. Now, I, I'm not actively involved in academia. I've given, I give lectures now and again, so I, I can't, I, my, I do realise that my uh, perspectives might be woefully out of date. And if they are, please tell me, because um, I do want to hear more from academia and from, and from universities in the ways that they're approaching, uh, you know, the, 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 the education of the architects. And I know that there are, 
loads of really progressive schools such as up in in Manchester but certainly when I was going for my training um, at the Bartlett not once do I think do we ever come I don't think I can't remember I do not remember ever once dealing with the constraint of finance and the way that business was often portrayed in university was something I mean it was so dry it was just like oh god the professional practice course this is not interesting it was almost seen as something that got in the way of your design education now I do take responsibility for that as being a young 20 year old uh, man who was interested in doing creative things and a lot of that probably comes from my myself as well um, but it, it, it was rare that you broached the conversation around finance or how much would this project cost in a conversation with uh, in your in your design conversations and interestingly as well that that kind of creates a sort of a reaction that anything financial is immediately an inhibitor and we kind of start relating to money as being something that prevents creativity as opposed to it being another constraint that we can start to learn to uh, play with and dance with and being able to get creative like the guys in property for example the guys in property when there's a financial constraint they start thinking how could we get the money how could we start to finance this how could we bridge uh, the money that we need for this section over here who can we get involved relationships start getting creative the role of the entrepreneur is very much a creative mindset to producing capital and bringing together resources in, in a new and inventive way um, that's able to bring value that, that then can be remunerated. And, you know, a lot of architects at universities, either they've been brought up in an entrepreneurial family or their parents are business people. Um, and I certainly saw a lot of this at the Bartlett where you did get people who were doing very entrepreneurially led things and projects. I've had a few of them on, on the show. Um, but this kind of, you know, aversion to discussion, discussing anything commercial or being involved in, in business kind of shuts down, I think, a lot of opportunity um, for architects to be. And it's another kind of way of expressing ourselves and also another way of unlocking, unlocking latent opportunity and value within the profession. So I'm just going to go to LinkedIn here because I also um, shared the poll on LinkedIn and we had some really great responses here as well. So again, I asked the question, um, do you agree that low fees are the biggest challenge? If so, why do you think our fees are low? Do you agree that our fees are low? What's the impact of low fees on the practice, on practice and the built environment? So if you're not following me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, go and do that right now. Go and type in at Ryan Willard and hit follow and then go and put at Business of Architecture UK and hit follow and you'll be privy to all these conversations as they are happening. Um, Stephen Drew, who is the head of architecture and design at McDonald and Company, said, not surprising really, lower fees are the source of a lot of problems. Low fees can mean less time and people on projects, which in turn means there are less billable hours. So the few that are stuck on a project work long hours. Exactly. You know, that kind of starts to put at the forefront here that our inability to command high fees has a impact on everybody. It really begins to inhibit our ability to make a difference on all these different ways. Now, there are structural problems, there are institutional problems, there are, you know, architects, for example, we do not defend our fees, perhaps in the same way that lawyers do, where they are very aggressive and very financially driven in many aspects uh, of, of, as, a, as a profession and they maintain their fees at a high at a high rate. Architects, we don't necessarily have that same culture. Um, Patrick Takashi Casey, who's the creative director commercial of interior design at, where does he work? 
at Avalon Design, which is a lighting company, he very interestingly said in response to Stephen's comment, perhaps this started when architects were allowed to advertise, creating a competitive cost-conscious market. Although it did bring about the birth of the Starchitect, and you can bet they don't have concerns over fees. So interestingly, you know, there are Starchitects who do command very high fees. Um, I don't I can't give you any facts or figures about how much higher certain architects charge than others. Uh, please, if you do know where some of these types of uh, research is, um, send it to me, get me involved in that conversation. I'd love to be able to go deeper into this topic. But I do know that there are many architects from small practice owners to micro practice owners to large architects who do command significantly higher fees than a lot of other architects. And often when you start to analyze what it is that those architect practices are doing, again, it's this ability to be able to articulate value and articulate value in a way that resonates emotionally deeply with their prospective clients. The clients feel like they're being understood, like they're being listened to, and like their best interests are at heart. And those guys, once that relationship is established, then there is the opportunity. I'm not saying this always happens, but there is the opportunity then to be able to uh, direct and create a different type of relationship, a design relationship, uh, a relationship with the client where there is parity uh, as the foundation of it. Um, Evgeny Rodionov, who is an uh, architectural designer at Wilkinson Air, replied to Pat Patrick Casey and said, Starchitect staff is affected by low fees even more as both client and manager expectations are higher than usual. They also use their star status to attract talent willing to work more hours for less pay, devaluing the profession even more. So this is a very interesting conversation. Um, speaking to Chris Hildry about this recently, about unpaid internships, about the kind of low fees that, uh, you know, uh, can end up sort of ricocheting down to uh, sort of lower paid architects. And that has a very detrimental uh, effect. So what he's saying here is that star architect um, fees may be lower. Or if star architects are commanding low fees, then that's going to have that they're in a position to be able to exploit perhaps other members of their team because they're using their status to attract talent. So that's a whole, that's a that's a, a big conversation in itself. But I mean, my own experience of working at Starchitect firms um, like RSHP, for example, was that we had a great life. I mean, Rogers is quite famous for, you know, really looking after their staff. And I think, and I do know that there are other practices that don't have that reputation. I'm very aware of that. I've spoken to many uh, employees of these kinds of places. Um, and again, it will depend on the sort of size of the office and the internal workings of the office of if they are commanding large fees, are they, how are they structured internally? Who gets to see those fees? A company like RSHP is very diligent and aware of pay relationships between, you know, the highest paid um, partner, senior partner, and the lowest paid fully qualified architect. It has a model where there is a ratio of, of I think it's no, no more than nine times the, the salary difference. That kind of keeps an office uh, with a certain amount of... Um, coherence, if you like, financially. Will Lloyd, director of White and Lloyd Construction Consultants and Quantity Surveyors, said, on the smaller side, the biggest challenge that I see as someone outside of architecture are unqualified designers massively undercutting architects. On the larger stuff, there seems to be a reluctance to work with contractor on DMB. Whatever your opinion is, clients are really keen to de-risk by paying more, ironically. Now, that is interesting. So I would think that it would be essential to work with both the contractors and clients side in the future. Now, clients are really keen to de-risk. Now, remember what I was talking about earlier with um, the offer that Joe Cowan 
created where she basically de-risked the process for the developer clients by understanding where their pain points were in their business, in their business models. Clients are really keen to de-risk. Now that, I think, it just needs a little bit of a meditation almost. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? You know, this is creating value right here. When you can, prov- when you can um, understand what the risk is to the client. So this is different from us saying, us telling a client what we think their risk is. We have to understand first what they perceive to be their risk and understand that and not understand, not, not appear to understand it as kind of paying lip service to it, but actually taking it on and understanding, again, most, in most cases, the business case the financial case, the commercial case, uh, where the risks are and how we can begin to communicate to that risk. Um, And by de-risking it, you know, we're creating value. Really, really interesting comment now. Anthony Mason, uh, who's a quantity surveyor for P6 Planning Property Investments, um, and all... (laughs) And all caused by architects undercutting each other to the point they cause themselves pain in doing work basically for free. So this is the idea that architects undercutting each other um, and creating this kind of race to the bottom in fees. I mean, I would say don't do that. Uh, John Keller actually responds to that by saying, I think quite a few architects are cutting their fees to compete with the, un, with the unqualified providers of architectural services, which is silly because they are incapable of competing with us, but they don't know what they don't know. They think they compete with us. It is a problem disrespecting architects and chartered engineer surveyors that has been around for decades and one that is unlikely to be solved quickly, except by making it illegal for non-chartered or non-registered professionals from designing buildings. Now that's again very interesting and a kind of reflection on the fact in the construction industry that the role the original role of the architect has been fragmented in many ways Um, these roles have been taken out and um, competing services are you know offering reduced packages if you like uh, much lower fees and there's a kind of commercial competitiveness here that's happening which you know means that often that there's a big loss in quality now from a business perspective again this is really like you know businesses are competitive and you know they will you, there will be other market solutions so again it comes down to the, our responsibility uh, to be able to create those killer offers and be educators of the marketplace and really take it on to communicate to our clients in their language whatever that language is and I don't mean like French or Spanish I mean the language of finance or the language of uh, of airports or the language of you know whatever the whatever the processes are the business cases are underneath our particular clients talking in their words um, that starts to create a different type of relationship uh, where we start to, and this is what a lot of other, these other businesses are very good at doing. Um, they are very good at either just competing purely on price, or they market themselves in a very different way, which fulfills a need. I have been at a party where this was somewhere in somewhere in Surrey, and I met a lady, and her and her husband had bought a house in somewhere near the green belt it wasn't in the green belt but they did some renovation work for it and she really loved the process and she'd she had she worked with um some some cad with some drafters architectural drafts people uh, she came up with the design idea she ended up scribbling and drawing things on you know bits of paper and you know then created the entire team to build the to build the house extension etc etc she really loved it she had a real feel for it and she was very entrepreneurially minded as well and when a number of people came to visit her home they asked 
who did this? Where did this project come from? It looks fantastic. She was like, that was mine. I can do the same for you. Fast forward four or five years, she's running a large property development company where she's employing around 30 to 40 architects. Now, she was saying to me, um, you know, there's often a bit of a conflict between her and the architects. Um, and I, I find it interesting because she, she's created a business there. She's, she's obviously satisfied and she knows how to talk to that demographic, that market, very, very well. She knows how to craft her service so that it's fulfilling on the need of that marketplace. And she's basically created a little niche and she's dominating it. And many architects are not winning work compared to her. Now, I didn't see the quality of her buildings. I don't know what they were like, so I've got no place to comment on them. But she was clearly doing a very good job of understanding client what is of value to those clients. Finally, we've got a few we've got a few more here. We've got Alicia Brown, uh, who's a freelance marketing consultant, and she says other. So in response to um, what's the biggest uh, challenge, she's put other. She said shrinking market influence. This is both a challenge and an enormous opportunity. The client-led nature of most architectural work limits the influence of the architecture industry and perceptions of its value. The built environment is facing so many challenges and the design problem solving that architects possess is curtailed by risk-averse clients. An entrepreneurial approach to practice that addresses problems such as housing affordability, building waste and building emissions is a seemingly largely untapped opportunity. This requires an entrepreneurial and networked approach that is collaboration with a wide range of other industries. Architecture industry myopia with regard to outdated self-limiting and subjective notions of design excellence also doesn't help. Yes, good design will always be important, but the traditional paradigm of success in architecture only serves the elite. The industry needs a new definition of success that goes beyond worshipping building form and looking to our peers for validation and gets stuck into addressing the needs of the masses. So there we go, a very uh, eloquent and articulate uh, response about the shrinking market influence. And I think that's a really, really powerful um, statement there. I'm just going to go and... Uh, recount some of the other comments that I got on different platforms um, I think this these were from Instagram so on Instagram people are a little bit more well it's anonymous so people are a little bit more kind of uh, I don't know how to say it politely um, but one one person said the ARB and the Reba are to blame for low fees Thatcher is to blame Maybe. I think that's long long and complicated. Undercutting, unqualified services was another one. The inability to articulate and communicate value, that came up again. Uh, institutional and outdated frameworks, which stem back from our education. Operational deficiencies. This was interesting. Um, you know, trying to ask, what is low fees? So what might be a low fee for one practice might not be a low fee for another practice. You know, um, a very lean and efficiently run architectural practice that's got systems, that's got um, automated marketing processes, that's got tools for advocacy so that they're constantly bringing in new work. Um, this is, you know, that becomes a very efficient business. So they're able to deliver something for less. You know, they don't have to, they don't have, or they could charge more. Um, or it's a smaller practice, or it's a small practice that's operating with just, uh, you know, remote workers, and it's very lightweight, and you can deliver a planning package for a high-end residential client for a lot less than a large corporate organisation that's got heavy overheads and an office. So there is going to be this this big divergence of what low fees means relative to the operational aspects of each business. So again, it's kind of quite important to bear that bear that in mind. And also this is why things like, you know, fee scales and fee standards or sort of standard standard percentiles um, can be quite useful in ensuring that we're not kind of just, you know, plummeting uh, and and you know 
trying to win work by undercutting. And I think it, in general, if you're getting that first part right, listening to the client in a way that they've not been listened to before and being able to articulate their problem better than anybody else, that puts you in a very different position um, to then if you're just responding reactively to a competition brief or a project brief and then you've got yourself up against three other architects all equally talented and the client doesn't really know how to distinguish between the three of you and you're all doing the same sorts of things and again you know like this um, like Alicia was saying you know many architects end up uh, their their main way of marketing is they're marketing to other architects. We're selling to competitors, which kind of, you know, we're, often we're more concerned with the validation of our peers than what the marketplace actually, how they perceive us and how they perceive us as being of something of value. And I really think that is, you know, this happens on so many different levels of how we can start the process of educating um, and sharing our expertise as architects, as, as leaders in the built environment, and how we can solve many of the problems of society. So I think that's enough from me on this topic. I'm going to please continue. Give me your opinions. I might have missed things out. I might have said things that contradict other things i want to hear i want to hear more from you guys basically as i start compiling this and begin to refine uh, a more articulate um, conversation and arguments and thank you very much for listening and um, speak to you all very soon and don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.